When looking at the chart, many people see gaps as those openings between the candles. And those are indeed gaps, but those are not the only gaps in the chart. In this video, I'm going to show you how do you find gaps, how do you identify them, how do you mark them, and how do you use them in your trading plan in order to increase your profits. All right, let's get into it. Today, we're going to talk about gaps. We're going to identify gaps. We're going to mark some gaps, and then we're going to trade some gaps. Or how do you trade gaps? We aren't necessarily going to trade them. We're going to look at how do you trade gaps. First question, what is a gap? A gap on a stock chart happens when the price of the stock jumps from one level to another without any trading happening in between. This usually occurs between the close of one day and the open of the next. Generally, it happens in the pre-market or the post-market. That's when you see gaps. And you can kind of look at this chart I put down here and identify some gaps, but I promise you there's more gaps here than you can see. Some of them jump right out at you because they're open spaces of time. You can see those, but there's other gaps on here. And when we go, as we go through this presentation, you're going to be able to see that there's other places where there are gaps as well. There are four types of gaps. There's four types. There's the common gap. These are the most frequent and they usually happen in a quiet market without any significant news or events. They're just like through the course of, of life. SPY, triple Q, which those kind of, I feel like they kind of have things, but just, just a normal movement and then there'll be some gaps. Common gaps tend to get filled quickly, meaning that the price will move back to cover the gap in the very near future. For example, if a stock gaps up from 30 to 31, it might soon trade back to 30 and fill and fill that gap. Those are common gaps, right? That's a that's one type. This is an example of a common gap here. Uh, this one may be too big to be a flat out common, but it's basically in the course of the movement, a gap occurs. This was not an earnings gap, by the way. I went and looked to make sure that it wasn't an earnings gap. This would have been another gap up here. This is a gap here as well. And there's a gap up here, which you can see, but you don't know if you can see this one as easy, but this one, and then it got filled by the next day's price action and then subsequent day. So this gap filled pretty quick. All right. This are common gap example. They just happen in the course of trading. Then there's a breakaway gap. Sometimes many call it a gap and go. This occurs when the stock price breaks away from a previous trading range, typically due to strong news or changes in investor, investor sentiment, right? Breakaway gaps often mark the beginning of a new trend and are less likely to be filled quickly. I gave another name for it called a gap and go. Basically, it gaps up and keeps going or it gaps down and keeps going. For example, a stock may, might, might gap up from 40 to 45 after positive earnings and then it continues moving upwards. Right, it continues today. The one of the stocks I'm going to show you here, which is this one, is AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca gap down this morning or overnight from last night to today. I really didn't figure out what actually happened. Probably some news on one of their drugs, but it gapped down and it continued to go down. Right, this was a gap and go. It kept right on going based on I'm presuming some type of news. Even this one, this one wasn't as much of a gap and go. It did gap and then try to pull back some. This gap didn't get filled though. And then it went on up a little higher. So this is like a partial gap and go. It did gap up, it pulled back some and then went on up and did its going. It still has not been filled. And then it's got skipped over. A part of it got filled with this candle. It might be all of it got filled with the rest of this candle but that's a, would be a gap and go also. That's a breakaway gap, generally based on news or earnings. An exhaustion gap occurs near the end of a strong trend and a signal that the trend is losing steam. It often occurs or can indicate a reversal or a slowing momentum. If, for example, if a stock has been moving up for a while and gaps from 80 to, what's that, 85, it might be a sign that the uptrend is nearing its end and the prices could soon reverse or flatten out. That's an exhaustion gap. It's like the last hurrah, our last little push, and then we're done. Here's one here. This is also on the AstraZeneca chart further back, but basically the finish of a trend, it gaps up, 
price action does fill it, but then the next day it falls back down and creates another gap. Same thing here, it gapped up, didn't really do any movement after that, took a little pause and then started to move on after a couple of days. An exhaustion gap is what those are called. I don't know if it necessarily matters, the name of the gap, as much as it does that you know that it's there and that you have a plan if you're going to try to trade it. The last one is a runaway gap or a measuring gap. These gaps happen during strong upward or downward trends and suggest the continuation of the trend. They usually appear in the middle of a price move, acting as a sign that there's still momentum behind the stock. For example, the stock, for example, the stock has been rising steadily. A runaway gap from 50 to 65 signals there's some more upside potential. Further upside potential. Okay, this is a runaway gap. Some runaway gaps here right in the middle of a trend. It just makes a gap that's not based on, this is PayPal again, not based on anything that happened. It's just in the middle of the trend, price jumps and moves on. Middle of the trend, price jumps and moves on. Okay, four different types. They all can look very similar, but those are four different types of gaps, right? I find the earnings ones generally are really big sometimes, and those are harder to feel. And we're going to talk about here soon. I'm going to show you about how to how to mark them. Actually, we're we're there. Gap should be marked from the close of one candle to the open of the next candle. This is Key now, gaps should be marked from the close of one candle to the open of the next candle. Then you can pull back off of that with the price action. It is filled when subsequent price action has gone all the way through it. I read something that talked about if the price action comes back through it really fast, like if it comes back through in one big candle, then it will probably come back through it again. If it kind of goes up into the gap and comes out and then goes up some more and comes out and then goes up some more, then that gap may be considered filled. But if it goes through the gap too quickly, it could maybe potentially have a, re, a retrace through that same gap, retrace up or down, basically. Let's show some, I'm going to show some, some ways that we've marked the gaps from the close to the open, right? So I've marked this from the close of the green candle. Right, the top, remember we talked about candlesticks. So the top of that green candle is the close up here, right? The top of the box is the close. And the open of the next candle is the top of this box going down. This would be the open. So all of this, we and I'm telling you, I'm I'm let, let's clarify some things because when I was taught gaps, I was taught that gaps, well, I was taught a couple things. I was taught that it went from body to body, first of all, and then I was taught that it maybe went from wick to wick, and then some that the wick wasn't considered the filling of it, and suchy suchy. Uh, so anyway, let's clarify all of that. The close of one candle to the open of the other, right? That's that's the gap. That is the the full gap there. We can talk in a minute about when is the gap, like what is it filled, and what does that look like? We can talk about that in a second. Close of one candle to the open of the next candle where there's a gap. It can be body to body, but it depends on which part of the body, whether it's the top or the bottom, you're going from close to open, which will be on the body, but it's not necessarily top, bottom of the body to the top <laughs> of the body, like on this one. This is, a, this is a gap here, and this gap is from the close of this candle, the close of that red one, the close of this candle, which is here, that's the close, right? And the open of this green candle though is at the bottom. It opens down there. Now, all of this stuff here will, is you know filling, this is partial filling of the gap because price action now takes us back up into the gap. So all of this would be considered filled, right? This is all considered filled by this candle. The next candle does fill the rest of it, right? But the first day, this green day, only filled that part there. But the, the candle, the gap, sorry, is marked from the close of one candle to the open of the next. Not just body to body, not not on not on just like quick look. 
close of one candle to the open of the next. And then this subsequent price action has filled that gap. And this, you know, the wick, I used to not count wicks as a closing, but as I was told, that is price action. So price action does. Now, I also feel like though, it, as a caveat to that, that price action of the open hours, not the pre-market and post-market hours. So regular daytime, 9.30 to 4, that those, I don't put the extended hours on my charts usually because when I'm looking at stuff, I don't consider the 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 pre-market and post-market movement, just the time that happens during the, you know, the main session. That's the triple Q right there. So now again, there's several gaps here that we can see. Some of the gaps are much easier to, to see. So we see red candle, the close of this candle, right? This is the close to the open of the next candle. That's the open. That would be considered our gap. Now, this one didn't get this price action over here actually finally filled that gap. But initially, price went on. This was like a gap and go. It gapped down and went on down some more and moved back up. There actually is a gap down here. right? I didn't mark that one. Gap down again. This green candle filled that gap the subsequent day. Gap here between these two, the close... Okay, so these are the ones we don't necessarily see right off the bat. You can see these holes between the candles. That's easier to see. But this one here, the close of one candle, which would be down here, to the open of the next candle, which is here. And that gap on PayPal has yet to be filled. This could be considered one of those gap and goes or breakaway. It didn't like look like it's earnings, but it gapped up and it kept on going up. We see a hole here between these two. This is the close of the candle. This is the open of the next one. That gap still remains unfilled. All right. This one here, this is a gap from close, close to open, but this gap was filled by this daily, you know, this day's price action. This candle opened and then came down before it went back up. So this gap would be considered filled because it was filled by the price action of the next day. And then there's one hiding in here. It's hiding in here. It's been filled, but it is hiding in here. If this, if this candle here, well, this one here would have filled it anyway. But if we went from the close of this candle, the close, and we went to the open of this candle. Now, this second candle, the price action from the day did fill the gap. So it's actually filled. This one is also filled, but it, it it was a gap. It was a gap down. You all see what I mean when I say that there's ones that are that stand out and are easy for us to see, and then there's others not so much. Not so much. Now, when you have these big gaps, this is this can be done on Trading View or Thinkorswim, but when you have these gaps. And so depending on the size of them, I may or may not put this four-part Fibonacci on it. And the reason I have this here or this marked is because each of these levels within the gap will also provide some support and resistance. There, these levels inside of the gap could provide support and resistance. Each of these, is this is on the 25 floor, it's into a quartile, so 25% mark, right? 25%, I got prices here, 84.42 is a place, 84.86 is the 50% mark, 85.29 is the 75% mark, and then the one is 85.73. At 85.73, the gap is considered completely filled. But what could possibly happen is this price could go in here, come on back down some, go on up, come on back down some. Generally, if it passes the 50%, it's probably going to go on, but that, that's, of course, a general lead because it doesn't always do that, and the top of the gap will also provide resistance. 
those four quartiles inside of there could potentially provide resistance in the gap. Definitely the top of the gap, the bottom of the gap, because generally you'll see that it'll pop up here and it may pop up again to here again, you know, subsequent candles and or maybe a little bit of wick will come in, but the body won't go. That's because inside of the gap, there are support and resistance levels, support and or resistance levels, depending on where the gap is located. How do we trade gaps? How do you trade gaps? First of all, you wait for that first, at least the first candle to form. Whatever your strategy is, whether you're trading for the day, whether you're buying, you're selling, whatever you're doing, you want to keep, don't let the gap be like um, in such a way that it makes you pause per se in your own trading. However it is, you normally would trade price action is how you would also trade a gap. Just knowing it's got its support and resistance is in there. At the top and the bottom, there's there's levels inside of a gap. You want to be, you know, confident of that too. If it gets into the gap, sometimes we see price get into the gap and depending on the momentum, it'll go on through it. Definitely, if you're talking about sometimes buying triple Q, they decide they want their gaps filled and they may keep going. You need to keep that in mind. If you're waiting for, if you're trading as a buyer or a buyer and you're buying up or buying down, you might want to see if it gets into the gap. You may want to wait and see how it responds at those levels. You know, if you're in a trade, you might want to see how that's going. If you're not quite in a trade, you want to see how it responds to those levels before you enter. Right. So you want to wait for the first candle or candles to form. And based on your trading method or your trading strategy, you want to trade the gap as you would any other price action for reversals, continuations, et cetera. And I already said that the gaps provide support and resistance. So like I trade the strat. With, if I'm trading as a buyer, I trade the strat. Well, the strat has actionable signals. Actionable signals being if there's a hammer, if there's a shooter, if there's an inside bar, these are things that are actionable signals. Those actionable signals are still in force even after a gap has formed, right? So just because we've got a gap and before I would just, I would a gap would happen. I'd be like, oh, I had a plan. Gap happened. I'm like, I'm just going to, I'll just wait, see what happens. You of course can wait till the gap fields and then go from there. Or you can just trade, you could trade it based on what you do see in your own strategy. As a seller, if you see a gap above or whatever, you might want to be beyond that gap, keeping in mind the plus minus number, keeping in mind there's support and resistance in the gap, and you still may want to be on the other side of it, or at least at the 50% mark. If, if, the, if the price hasn't gotten into the gap, you may consider using the 50% mark as your sale leg keeping in mind your plus minus number and probability, all the things that we use to determine our prices. Sometimes though, being beyond the gap is too far away for us to, for you to get premiums. So if it doesn't, if, it, if it's not like um, desirable, then just go find something else. We just find something else to trade. There's so many, so many fun things to trade, right? You can use the Fibonacci. You can use, again, your plus minus number. You can look back at previous support and resistance and put lines on based on that. I mean, there's, you know, all the things you would normally do. You still want to keep, you can still do those even if you've got a gap that you're working with. Now, there are people who trade a gap as a whole strategy. They trade just gaps. And, and that's a thing you can do too. But if you're trading just a regular strategy and gaps, you're not just focusing on gaps, then just know that's a place that, you know, the, the nature of whores a vacuum. So it may try to fill it. So if it gets close to it, it may, it may try to fill it, but that doesn't mean you have to be like, oh, it's got a gap, but better go find something else. You don't necessarily have to. You could just, you know, again, acknowledge that it is a gap. Maybe use your Fibonacci or use something 50% mark if you just want to put a line on it. You could do that knowing that there is some support and resistance inside the gap and keep it going from there. When I think significant gap, I think of something that is like bigger than the, the daily ATR. Like, so if we're going to look at AstraZeneca, which is one that gapped down this morning, but if the AstraZeneca ATR is like three, I don't know what it is, but let's say it's three, but it gapped down eight, you know, then it's it's kind of not in the nature of AstraZeneca to run eight all in one day. So that means if it gets into the gap, it may take multiple days to, to fill that gap. I mean, I think UPS has a really big gap. It's trying to come back through. 
stuff like that. I think you just have to keep in mind what's the average true range. I know that for buyers to go into a gap field, the, the, the levels inside the gap are seen as targets. Like if you're, you know, you've got your target set for where you want price to go next or where you expect price to go next, those 25, 50, 75% marks are seen as targets. And then 100% mark or when the gap is filled is seen as like a final target. If you're going, if your trade is taken, if your price action is taking you into the gap as a buyer, that those are seen as targets along the way. As a seller, of course, we want to be beyond where price is going to stop. At least this is why we keep in mind the ATR and the, the plus minus number or implied volatility, as well as we keep Delta. I mean, all the things that we would normally do. Maybe you go on outside the gap, especially if it's in short term. If you, you know, got today and the gap is a pretty good size, then maybe you don't stress it. But if it's if you are getting in and, the, and you've got four or five days or three or four days and the gap could potentially get gone through, you want to keep that in mind if you're trading for the week and you're entering at the beginning of the week and there's a gap that it's that it's that is, you know, in proximity. And so this is that AstraZeneca we were looking at. AstraZeneca actually does seem to have several gaps that are still like it seems to have seem to have several more gaps. Some of them are filled. It's it seemed to be like somewhat of a gappy little mover, right? We got gaps here, but that's been filled. A gap here has been filled. A gap here has been filled. Gap here was filled by this, but some of them have not. So this one, I wanted to show how you pull back off of the gap to see what has already been filled, okay? So in this case, I'm putting, this went from the close to the open, right? But even there, part of this gap, I'm gonna put this line here, part of this gap has been filled. It was filled by this price action. It was filled by the wick of that candle. So over to here, right? And then, but then still the price action has filled it. This, both of these have filled that price action. Thank you for that because I want to make sure that we're on the right candles. So this part here now is still unfilled, right? Because this part up here was filled by price action. So we would call this part of the gap already filled. If you're looking at this one, we look from top to bottom, right? This part here underneath the, the wick, and I probably should just use my boxes that won't look as junky, but all of this is unfilled still, right? Let me put another line here. Why do you think, why do I care? Why do we care about it being unfilled? Well, we care because if price comes back into this area like this one just did, right? If we had over here, there was a little bit left down here at the bottom that wasn't quite filled yet. And look what happened. Today's candle dropped down, went right down through there, went right down through, through there, and then filled it. That little extra piece that was lingering at the bottom down here got filled by today's price action. So anybody who was trading AstraZeneca today, if they had this gap marked, they had that gap marked, they would have known it was it, it was falling today, it was coming down today, but it went down as low as the bottom of this gap where it filled it. And then what did it do? It turned back and it closed. It closed at the top of that gap. Price action went down to the bottom, down into this. Let's see what where is that? What is that price? Price action went down as low as low, 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 as 8246. Right. But then it closed right back up here. Well, I can see where this one closed. It closed at 83. I feel like once the gap is filled, then I go ahead and take it off. But if it's not completely filled, I think you should leave it. Now, what I do on TradingView, you all have seen me before on TradingView, I'll put a, I'll put the gap there and then I will put another rectangle over the part that's not filled. So it'll, it lets me see that the darker part has not been filled all the way. So I know that it could potentially go back to that area to fill again or to fill the rest. 
And I leave the, I used to take off the part after it was field time. I used to take it off and, and I was watching TJ chart and he was like, he leaves his on until it's all the way filled. And I thought, okay, works for me. Wait, we'll leave it there till it's all the way filled. That way, you know what it was, that it wasn't just that little portion of a gap, but it had maybe filled a uh, 50% already. So the rest of it to be filled, it was going to have to get back through what it had been through already to fill the rest. Okay, so I want to look back here. So if we were, we of course can see all of this now, but let's say we we could not see what AstraZeneca did back here. We couldn't see all this extra stuff here. And all we had was the, the close of this candle to the open of that. That means it gapped all the way up to the top of that because the open was up here. Now this is our daily candle. Now it looks like, looks like the, Wick of this came down to about the 50% mark. It came down to about the 50% mark. I think that would be if I was eyeballing it, that looks like about halfway, huh? And then it turned around and, and well, it closed higher, left us with the doji. Hey there, trader. I think I've discovered why most traders are not profitable or are not consistently profitable. And that is the lack of charting technical analysis. Yes, it is a lost art, basically. We're looking at the chart. We see that the candles are going up and down, but not really knowing what is really happening. Everything you need to know, almost everything, like 99% of what you need to know is in that chart. So I've created a training resource that is called Chart Your Way to 100K. It starts with the basics of what is a candlestick, all the patterns, all the things like that. Starts with the basics and then it goes up from there. It includes candlestick patterns, chart patterns. It includes um, indicators. It includes what you should be looking at when you're charting, trend analysis, gap analysis, all these different things. Everything you need to go from no charting ability up to being a master charter, you can find in this Chart Your Way to 100K resource training. All right, you can go ahead and grab it at my website, educatortotrader.com. I promise you, this is going to make the huge difference in your trading consistency. All right, go ahead and grab it. All right, so if with the, those who were buying calls, hopefully would have waited to see what happened on this doji day because doji means indecision. So when we've got indecision, you wait and see what happens next. Right. If you were going to trade it going back down, you know, as a, a strata, you might look at that, but it's really not enforced. Enforced means it's beyond below this right here. It ain't really didn't really close below there. So as a strata, you I would keep waiting as a seller. Then this might have now the next day would have shown that it's got this is resistance. So the, the thought may be if I wasn't in yet to think about maybe a call credit spread. Maybe if you went in yet, but if you was in already, then you working with your thing there. Next day, another doji. Now, if you're in calls, your trade, you're basically theta's eating up your money because it's not doing anything but dancing back and forth, right? This would be called a one candle. Y'all remember we talked a little bit, and only a little bit the other day about a one candle, and a one candle is in between. It's in between the high of this candle and the low of this candle. This one is in between those, which is a doji looking anyway. So a one candle, we don't do anything on a one candle. Now, one candle work out great if you're selling because you just you like the price to just sit there and not do a lot because theta decay is working. And that's a good thing for us. We like theta decay as sellers. As buyers, not so much. This right here is just eating your eating your money away, eating your premiums up. Okay, next day, we do a little bit more movement. AstraZeneca's not doing a lot. It's just kind of chilling, right? But if those of us who would be in call and put credit spreads, it, it's still moving up a little bit more. And then it's still, we see our moving averages have kind of opened up a little bit too. And it's still climbing. It's not climbing hard, but it's still going up. It did pick up some momentum and started moving on the 21st and went on about its way. So those of us who had put credit spreads back here, that trade is now was closed. It didn't even, it didn't come back to our area. Now for my call credit spread idea, 
depending on where I went for a call credit spread and how many days I was going to be there. I think the 23rd would have been that Friday. Then depending on what I had for a strike price, if this was 85, I probably would have had 86 or 87. Then that would have, you know, this didn't close. They're closing the 85 range. That might have worked. This Friday might have got me, though. It went on. It closed up here above 86. And it really did hit some resistance up at 87 and some change, and it came back. But these little doji candles also give you, inf give you information that there wasn't a whole lot of, of steam. That AstraZeneca basically, you know, the volume is not very high. And these little bitty candles aren't showing you a clear direction. They're making a little bit of movement, but they're kind of dancing around the same zones. Moving around the same zone. There wasn't a whole lot of strength going up. It's still slightly moving up, but it's not a whole lot of strength. And then it hit where it was going to go and it came back. FDA approvals or rejections have an impact on the price. Anytime we're trading, you're trading earnings, you're, you're you know, always putting yourself in the line of fire. So, you know, I always suggest that if you're trading earnings as a buyer or a seller, that you really can wait till after the earnings call is made and then ride it after that. Like the earnings call was here. All of this stuff was leading up to earnings. The earnings call happened today or yesterday, I guess. It gapped down and um, and it left it. Some people went with the gap and go. Some people, you know, rolled on down, rolled it on down, down, down. And then it closed here at 83. Let's go look at that PayPal. PayPal has its set of its share of gaps as well. That look almost like AstraZeneca. Well, it looks the same, doesn't it? Where are we putting our gaps? We've got one here. And I would look at the ones, you know, that are kind of closest to current price action. So I'm kind of far back here. There would have been a gap in between these two. It's been filled already, as we can tell, but it, there is one there. This There's one here, but it got filled by this subsequent day. This one here, there was one, but it got filled by that day. This price action from the very next day filled it. This itty bitty baby here, though, I'm not sure if y'all can see that itty bitty baby. It's not um, it's not filled. That one hasn't hasn't been filled. There was one back here, but it got filled by price action. So when I'm doing my charting, I like to look at to see, you know, where are there some close, are there some close gaps that are around? So that way, if we're looking for, if there's a gap above for sure, because if you're trying to trade it as a, a buyer, you want to see if there's a gap field, you could potentially use that. I don't see one. I think PayPal is at a all-time high or 52-week high. 74 was there, so that's not really anything there. I hit it so fast, and then it moves too quick. Looks like PayPal likes to fill its gaps, even if it doesn't do it fast. This one here was a pretty big gap. This one from, and this probably was an earnings gap. Yep, this right here was an earnings call. PayPal dropped down right through there. This was a pretty big gap from 63 down to 57. So about a six point gap. And then it, see how it danced in and danced around, went up a little bit more, fell back down, then went on up the rest. Right, this probably, this looks like about the 50% mark. If I was eyeballing it, it went back up, gap down, went back up a couple days because the first day it fell down further. Then it went on up into the, the couple days later, dropped back down. Right. Let's look at this because this would actually be the close of this candle and it gapped down to the open of this one. So all of this is a newly created gap would have been. And then these subsequent candles did fill it. But this was the close to the open. This would have gapped down back to the bottom of the gap that was created back here. It did go on up and fill it, but that would have been a gap. They're hiding. The gaps are trying to hide from us. They don't want us to know about them. But they do get filled. PayPal filled it and then it went on back up to the 50% mark again. Look at all these days. So this is the daily chart. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 days, which is what, about three weeks? Three weeks of price action here. And then it fell back off a little bit, back to the bottom of the gap. 
another, this is another week. And then on that next week, it went ahead and got moving. Once it got past the 50% mark here though, it pushed pretty good all the way up to the top. Notice it went all the way to the top of the gap. It did pull back a little bit. Well, the close was here. Then this one would have been the next one. And then it went on up from there. Gap here. Got filled the next day. Going on up. Once I put a gap onto a chart, I try to leave it there until it gets filled. So you'll see that even like here, I'm on... I'm looking at this triple Q and I'll just drag them across until, until into the current price. So if they, so that way <clears throat> in the future, when the price starts moving, if it starts getting closer down here, that'll help me just to know that there's a gap that could be close by. If you're charting your same stocks kind of regularly, then once you put a gap, once you put identification of a gap on, just leave it there and keep dragging it you know, across. I use the box here, the gray box, because it doesn't, feel like if I, I do box. I used to do the lines, but then I would forget why the lines were there. So if I do the box, I know that those are my gap boxes. Okay. So right here on the QQQ, mm -hmm. you have two, the prices in between two gaps. Mm -hmm. So as you look at that chart, with that gap that's closest at 481, I think it's 481.35 or 451.35, would you be more influenced or just aware of that gap than maybe the price to go down to fill that? Or are you thinking the gap is going to go up to that top gap? Which 481? This one here? Yes. Okay, 451. Well, it would be what depending on what the price action is doing. I would just, you know, have them both identified on there. But if it gets close to a gap, again, knowing that nature abhors a vacuum, it's closer to this one. If it gets close to a gap, the potential for it to go and fill it is there. And, you know, we know the market enough to know that that is high, that it'll drip down in here and do a quick drop out of nowhere, fill the gap and then run. And you're like, what? Where'd that come from? And, it'd be, and it would have come from some gap that was nearby. Okay. Right. I'm thinking, I look at this one here. This is just an example of whether that's what happened or not. I don't know. But here we have a gap from the close to the open, which would have been that right there. Right. Which would have been this candle. All this danced around, danced around, danced around. And when it got here, this hammer would lead you to believe it was going up some more because hammers generally are an upwards movement. But the next day it dropped right on through that gap the entire day. Could it have been because there was a gap back here? Yeah, it could have been because of whatever happened on, you know, September the 2nd, which was Monday, went for no reason because everybody was expecting upwards movement after this hammer. There wasn't anything necessarily that said this, the price action on Tuesday, sorry, would have been Tuesday because Monday was a holiday. Nothing in no events per se happened that said this should have fallen off like this, except for that NVIDIA stuff. I think the NVIDIA... Antitrust, which either happened yesterday or Tuesday. These are the NVIDIAs. NVIDIA had some problems. <clears throat> but you can say, well, it was that. Or was it the fact that there was a gap that was created back here and it needed to fill it? Don't know. <clears throat> I would keep it in mind. I would just know. I would use it, put on my chart, and then have it there to just know that it's present. Depending on what your trading strategy is. As a seller, we don't worry about those things as much because you know we just want to make sure where price doesn't go but as a buyer you need price to keep moving so if price gets into a gap or it does it gets to the gap and turns it back you're like no so you kind of got to know where they are but there's one up here too that is from the close to the open it's still up here and it hasn't been filled the moving average is definitely have crossed over looking like they want to keep pushing down a little bit the top of this gap is going to provide support. I mean, yep, support. 455, it's going to provide some support. Whether it's going to take the momentum to push on through it, which it could be there's a lot of, you know, downward pressure. We seem to be going on a downward ride here. So it could go on through there and pick it up and keep it moving. There's There can be so much to chart, which why you got to have, I feel like you have to have a simple strategy because there's so much to charting. <laughs> like there's so many things to consider that the strategy has to be as simple as possible because there's so many things to take into consideration. <laughs>